Hello there, Prehistoric Kingdom friends. Today we have the March Dev Diary from Prehistoric Kingdom, and we're going to jump straight into it. So the first thing here we see is the T-Rex. There is a baby T-Rex. They put that at the end, and for me, this is the most exciting part, baby dinosaurs. So we're going to have a look at this gorgeous T-Rex and uh, see what the team are talking about. So... Uh, these are some test images. Uh, you can see we have the baby T-Rex here and in the background we do have an adolescent as well. We're expecting some proportions and face shapes to change before ontogeny is fully implemented and added to the public game. But this at least gives you an early look at how these fluffy balls could look. As mentioned previously, all baby skins are designed to blend into their adult coloration regardless of what skin was selected. In the case of our T-Rex here, that means all Tyrannosaurus would start as feathered infants and either lose feathers through mutation, i.e. growing up into a scaly skin, or retain them, i.e. growing up into the feathered skin. We can't wait to share more looks at ontogeny with you in the future. I mean, look at the size of that thing. It's absolutely ridiculously small. And I, I just, I want them. I really want baby dinosaurs in our parks as soon as possible. But yeah, they look awesome. So jumping back up to the start of the dev diary here, they're going to be working with the brilliant Nigel Marvin and they're going to be working on the dialogues which are lacking within the game at the moment. However, they are also going to be adding and introducing new animal alternative genus. So we've got the Tarbosaurus and the Coronasaurus, which you can see there as well. But basically the recording session with Nigel means that they're planning to have all dialogue which are going to be released in early access. They're also going to be fixing the case of the uh, American cave lion here um they've made a joke here about don't know what horrors that this guy has seen but they are going to change it so it's a little bit more subtle this is kind of give it a bit more softer within the eyes and don't they've actually like pointed it out to me um I, I never really seen the horrors of uh, what the old eyes were experiencing so yeah uh, a very nice change for the cave lion there also, the Sporter bundle is available, which has the Art of Prehistoric Kingdom Volume 1 in it. Some really, really gorgeous pictures in there. Um, the art book provides you with 200 pages. We'll have a look at that a little bit later on. Um, and also the music, which is from Byron McKay. Some of the tracks in there are absolutely gorgeous. It gives you goosebumps. It's so beautiful. There's one in particular, which is my favourite song. And honestly, the first time I listened to it, I cried. I actually cried. Uh, this is how much that this soundtrack is just so gorgeous. So yeah, definitely go away and get both of these. And um, we're going to scroll down here and it gives you a bit of a glimpse of what you can expect within the art book here. So like I said, there is 200 pages to look at concept arts, environment renders and concept sheets. This gives you an idea of uh, the planning. Um, it also gives you a really good description of the, the design of everything and all the you know iterations that they went through um it's just really really good so in development in late april we're going to be rolling out update 11 which is going to be the public testing branch on steam so basically they're looking for people to test it out it's going to massively change how the game is being played so it's important that we have the community providing feedback during the production and uh, we also have a new species here so in update 11, it will be introducing two new animals, the first one of which is a squirrel-like dinosaur from Down Under. So this is the Lielonosaurus, and you can see that it's absolutely tiny and gorgeous. Look at the feathers, look at the colours, it's so beautiful. So here we go, there's a little bit of a description down here that we'll read. Oh, there's also some pictures. Oh, lovely. Oh, it's having a little scratch. That's beautiful. So we can learn a lot about the Lianosaurus here. So it is a southern part of Australia and it was found in the Cretaceous period and uh, they have plumage um, on their skin as they uh, went through various cold tolerances due to going weeks without sunlight. So that is me summarising that for you. Uh, these look really awesome. I really like them. The colours look absolutely incredible. 
They also look really, really small. They look like small little dinosaurs, which is what we love in Prehistoric Kingdom because we do have the massive ones, but it's also nice to include the little guys as well. So yeah, really looking forward to these. Um, and I'm, I'm so curious to what kind of sounds they make. They kind of remind me a little bit of the Dryosaurus, but their, their feet are absolutely incredibly big. Like, look at them. That's insane. It's like massive feet, tiny hands. What does that tell you about dinosaurs, does it? And we're also getting a new species, which is whatever this could be. I honestly don't know. When I see these all the time, I want to give it a good guess, but no idea what this could be. So if you guys want to have a, a, a good go in the comments below, then feel free. They're also going to be splitting up the species in the nursery and it's also going to be in the animal information signs too. So you can see here that the cave lion or panthera has now been split up and we also have the paraceratherium as well, they've been split up. So yeah, it looks really good and it's going to be a lot easier if you want a specific skin that you can just go ahead and look for it. Um, so that's going to be in the nursery or the excavation menu that you will find that. And the reason for them doing that was because that the game and each species was already considered unique. So they're wanting to make sure that this reflects within the UI and uh, it's also going to have a big change with the animal nursery when that gets a big UI overhaul down the line as well. So as part of update 11, we are going to be having keepers and laborers available as that is the most relevant part to the stage of the development that they are at currently. And then the remaining staff, which is janitors, engineers and security will be added a little bit later on. So at the beginning of building your park in update 11, that the feeders and kiosks are now going to be empty. So we are going to have to get our staff members to stock everything up. And that's where the logistics gameplay begins. So you can see here that all these are empty now and we're going to have to assign a staff member to come and feed them all up. So that's really exciting. A little bit of gameplay coming to Prehistoric Kingdom, which I think a lot of players will be really eager to get involved with. And uh, this is just looks really good. So to get resources into your zoo, players will first need to build a loading bay. Upon the initial first time placement, players will receive an immediate shipping of goods to help get their park up and running. After that, your loading bay will continue to import guest meals, merchandise, and a small amount of animal feed every 15 minutes. Time not yet finalized. Via box truck. Players can purchase up to two additional box trucks for their loading bay to speed up delivery times and place additional loading bays around the park if they need more shipments. This is so cool and the thing is, even though that this is a, um, it says modular group here, I think this is just one like solid building and honestly that looks incredible. You could just put that down in your park and then that's it done. Like you don't really need to add anything to jazz this up, although I think, you know, you could have the option to do that. But yeah, I think it just looks really, really good. See there, we can add some trucks in as well. Tells you how long until your next delivery and then your resources come in there as well. How much you have in stock. Uh, just, it looks so awesome. You can also mark it as a high priority as well. So once the resources have arrived, players will need staff to transport them around the zoo. It's interesting that they use the word zoo and not park. Anyway, laborers can carry the meals and merchandise to guest facilities, while keepers are needed to refill feeders with animal feed. To access the staff hiring menu, players will need to build a staff center, of course. Like any module, these new structures can be built over or recolored with the modular building system. Just ensure any access points, i.e. doors, remain accessible. So again, this is really cool. I really like the, you know, simplicity of this. Um, it's a really good, decent size as well. And I love the fact that you can switch it out as well if you're you're not really feeling the in-game vibe. If, if this is maybe a little bit too modern for yourself, you could go away and, and jazz it up, so to speak. So yeah, this is really nice. You also see in the UI here, it says that it's a work in progress, but you can have your lighting. You can keep the lights on or off. I wonder if that's going to have any impact on your electricity running through your park as well. Uh, I would imagine it does because there's like a little symbol here for cost. 
So yeah, really interesting to see how that is going to play out. So this is the concept art for hiring staff. So you can see a lot of John Smiths there. We've got engineers, janitors, we've got laborers, and then we've got temporary artwork here and a little bit of description about John, I would imagine. And also, <laughs> John has got an extremely well-paid job. What's that? $9,999 um, per month. I need John's job. That's an incredible amount of money to be receiving. I mean, I guess because it's a, a you know a dinosaur park, his insurance will have to be pretty good. But regardless, uh, John, if or prehistoric kingdom, um, I would happily uh, be a whatever John is a laborer. But again, I think this is all just you know placeholder right now, um, so I wouldn't maybe worry about that too much. There's also the, the star rating here. So I guess that's maybe how skilled um, a particular person is going to be as well. So that's maybe going to affect their pay, which is really interesting because if you have someone that's obviously more skilled, you can see here that they've got way more um, of an, a, a wage coming in. Um, but again, this is all temporary. I'm looking into things probably a little bit too much. Also, it refreshes as well, which is, is interesting because you might have someone that is maybe coming in experienced and then you know, that person might go off your list and then you've only got like inexperienced people. So yeah, really, really interesting. I've also noticed down here that there's like a little temperature gauge and I'm wondering if that is going to affect the animals or a guest within your park as well. It's something that we currently don't have in game. So that is really, really interesting to me. And also the, the little icon here, that's not the prehistoric kingdom one. Um, again, this is all temporary, but I do like looking at this stuff. So it says, while out in the park, staff are intended to be very automated. You can call staff to complete specific tasks, like refilling a certain feeder or, or transporting goods. But with the scale of prehistoric kingdom, the expectation is they should just do their jobs. We believe your primary role as park manager should focus on who you hire, how many people you hire, and how you lay out the park's logistics, infrastructure, rather than micromanaging where your staff are and what they are doing. If jobs aren't being done, you likely don't have enough people or your layout stinks. I feel like that's kind of a fair comment. However, it would be quite nice if you could go away and, you know, maybe have a laborer or, you know, a veterinarian or someone you can actually assign to like certain paddocks so that they know that they are going to be like feeding or transferring goods to certain areas. One thing that I actually really miss within games, and again, this probably maybe falls under the micromanaging, but I'd like to know that if John Smith is going to be a veterinarian, I want to know that he is absolutely 100% going to be taking a look at my T-Rexes because they could easily just jump out anytime that they want. Although, again, maybe that's because my layout stinks. But, you know, I, I don't know. I kind of want to push back on that a little bit. It would be really interesting if there was more of a you know, from the hours of eight o'clock in the morning when John starts, he will be looking after the T-Rex and then he'll go have his lunch and then, you know, it's just something like that because I, I would want to know that my park is being well looked after and that is down to me putting those things into place. Again, that's just how I like to play games. Expanding storage. This actually really excites me. This, this is how much of an absolute geek I am. So picture this. You've got a few habitats. The zoo is expanding, but there's also a distance between the loading bay and the park. We've got the loading bay at the back here with the goods and the produce are moved from here. And then they go into different storage supplies. So we've got good storage, which is this grey building, and then we've got the produce storage, which is this green building. So basically this means if you've got a shop here that the staff will then restock this from the good storage rather than walking all the way back to the loading bay, which is absolutely incredible. So you're going to have this main hub where all your deliveries are coming in and then it's kind of like offshoots into an area where, you know, some will pick up the goods here, then store it here, and then they'll restock it into your shops and your restaurants. And when the, your stock starts to 
go down and you don't have anything else, then they'll go to these hubs here to then restock rather than walking all the way back. And I think that's just absolutely incredible. That is like, that is a game changer. That is just chef's kiss. Whoever who thought this up is an absolute genius. And I love it. And I'm here for it. And I support it. It does say that these warehouses are planned to have some basic UI options that will dictate how they should be filled up, i.e. stop fruit from being delivered to this produce storage module, but we're aiming to make it more contextual. So the produce station near the meat feeder is naturally going to have more meat delivered to it than the produce station that is next to the herbivore paddock. That's all a bit more theoretical though, just sharing how we'd like them to work. To be honest, I would prefer to be able to, and again, this is me micromanaging, but I think like a drop down menu so you can say like in here we're going to be storing the meat and then it's up to the player to like actually like set that up. It's going to be like a drop down and a click of a button. And I just think it adds that element of gameplay, you know, like it just makes it more fun. But again, that's just me because I think I do actually like to micromanage. But from a casual player base, I guess it makes kind of more sense that if you have a range that is herbivores in that area, then it will lean towards more of a herbivore base. But again, how will it know? How would it know? Unless you had within the UI section, if you had a column that said produce storage small green fills up herbivore station habitat one. And again, it's a little bit more in depth with your management or maybe like a click and drag button or something. I don't know. I just feel like it would be more interesting to allow the player to do that. And it also means for scenarios, for example, if you have a T-Rex which has escaped, you log into it and there's a T-Rex running about and you find out that someone's like sabotaged the food, you've then got to go in and say, okay, well, why is this one over here beside the the um, the T-Rexes? Why is that a herbivore feeder? Like, you know, like I, I think that was more of a fun gameplay element rather than just assuming that everything's lovely. But again, I think it's just because I want more of a hardcore gameplay element to be the Star Kingdom than the average player. You smell that. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? No, we're talking about poop here. So there's a poop pile which is going to get moved to, uh, well, moved by the keeper to the compost heap here. Um, so this is all temporary, but still, it's so good. I just absolutely love it. So when animals eat and eventually poop, uh, without a place to dump their dung, keepers can clean habitat. This is why you'll need to invest in a couple of compost heap modules. So this is going to be really interesting and I wonder if this opens up like um, maybe tools and stuff that the keepers will use. Do you know what I'd absolutely love to see? I'd love to see a keeper come into a paddock or a habitat and they have a wheelbarrow and they're going up to the dung. This is the animation. I'm happy to give all my secrets away. They're going up to the dung, they get out a shovel or whatever, and then they, they start like shoveling it into uh, the wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow obviously fills up. They then walk to the compost heap and, um, and then dumps it in there. Or even they put the wheelbarrow onto like a, a golf cart or something and then, or a, a small truck and they drive it off to the compost heap. Yeah. Although I feel like the compost heap might have to have a, a radius. And again, it's part of the management towards what prehistoric kingdom could potentially be, is if you have the compost heap um, within a, a, a range, you could then manage that compost heap A or 1 um, is allocated to this paddock here. And which then would trigger the keeper knowing that if I'm looking after this paddock over here, that's where I fill things up. So that's how I'm thinking about things. Regardless, for a pile of poo, I love it. I mean, we're basically thinking on the same line here. So it does say that the keeper will transfer the poop to the habitat to the nearest compost heap. Once delivered, the stored poop will convert into compost over time, a resource that can become invaluable when making your own animal feed. Oh my God, they're going to be eating the poop. 
<laughs> I mean, sure, I'm sure that's what animals do. Um, this module can be a pretty negative impact on park beauty, so you want to keep it hidden from the guest view. I mean, I can understand that. This is the only part that I would actually agree with, because in some games, which I'm not going to name, name of the game, but if you know, you know, they'll see like um, like a, a staff facility and then the park, the guests in the park is just like, oh, it's, it's such a negative impact. And I'm just like, what, because you can see John eating his lunch? No, my friend. But if I see a pile of poo, I'm going to say something about it. Plus this, the smell would be ridiculous. So that I agree with. I agree with that aspect of it, but if they implement into the game that they're getting annoyed because they can see staff facilities, that's when I draw the line. Unless you can toggle that on and off, because then that gives the player more of an opportunity to be like, well, this is going to be never impact if I like jazz it up a little bit or hide it, then that's adding a gameplay element to Prehistoric Kingdom, which again is great. But I don't feel like that should be a must for all players, depending on if that's your playstyle. Creating produce. After a certain amount of park growth, the measly amount of animal feed you get from the loading bay isn't going to be enough. Thankfully, this is where the produce station comes in. A produce station is available to passively create food for your animals by converting the compost in your park into feed. As long as staff can keep delivering compost, you can keep making produce. Oh my god, I absolutely love this. I love the logistics of this. My brain is already like, this is a crazy amount of management. I can understand now why they're just like, hey, let your staff do their job. They have so much to do. So, okay, your staff have to look after your animals, but they also have to clean up their poop. Then they have to put it into the compost. Once it's in the compost, they then move it to the produce station. Once they have the produce station, they're going to have to move it to the, the loading bays, which is... This is insane. I love it. Oh my god, PK. But also, I kind of want to manage that as well. Like, I want to manage John's schedule. Plus, John's getting paid 9k. For 9k, I will shovel shit. Apologies for the cursing. Produce stations can be specialised to cultivate a specific dietary type. Plants, fruit, meat, fish, insects. Or produce all dietary types for a lower yield per compost conversion. As your produce station fills up, labourers will transfer it out and place the feed into the produce storage modulars around the park. Basically what I just said. In the event that you have no storage modules, your keeper will instead take food directly from produce stations when doing refill feeders. So we have two examples here of how this works. So the one on the left is filling up leaves. So you've got like the carrots here and the cabbages and it just looks incredible. And then one on the other side, I would imagine that's fruits because we've got watermelon and banana trees. Oh, it's just so good. So you have resources here where it says that your compost is running low. So that means your keepers would then have to ask for more compost to be delivered. It tells you there the compost. So you've got 26 out of 250 kilograms and it's producing. So you've got in stock is 325 out of 500 kilograms of plants. I wonder if you can upgrade this as well, or if you have to put loads of these around your park. Because I'm not sure how much, like, an animal would eat. And I'm really interested to figure out how that's going to work for meat and fish. How you can take animal poop, make it into compost, and then transfer that into meat and fish. And then this one seems like a bit of a mix. So it is currently producing... With the amount of compost that comes in, we've got leaves, fruit, meat, fish, and insects. So although it's a smaller yield from it, you can only get, well, no, you can get 100 kilograms um, instead of the other one, which was 500 kilograms. Okay, I see what they've done here. So I think in total that these can hold 500 kilograms. And you could probably mix it up. So if you wanted meat and fish in here, 
then it would probably yield 250 kilograms of fish and 250 kilograms of meat, which then you would have your 500 kilograms in total. So I'm thinking that's how it works. You basically select what you want to be producing out of these stations and then it will alter it depending on what you actually want to produce. That makes more sense. So we've got the logistics system here and I wonder if what I thought is correct or not. They've also made a change from January. So the general staff, they will now be only attending cashiers and kiosks. Um, instead of getting involved. Uh, because of this change, the idea of janitors and labourers temporarily taking on other job has been scrapped. To be honest, not a big deal. We also have a new system. So coming up on update 11 is a brand new module, the Fossil Depot. This building provides space for the park's dig team and grants access to the excavation menu. It is here that players will be able to both buy and send out dig teams to various dig sites around the world. These sites are used to obtain the necessary DNA required to create animals in the animal nursery. The idol dig teams currently not excavating will eventually be visible in the car park below. Oh my gosh, I wonder if we'll be able to actually like drive around the cars like in Jurassic World Evolution. That would be pretty awesome. So by hovering over the dig site, players will be able to see the potential operation cost of an excavation, the estimated time for excavation cycle, and whether or not there are events impacting the dig site. Once opened, up to five dig teams can be assigned at once increasing the ongoing operation cost in exchange for a higher DNA yield every cycle. There is no financial penalty for moving teams from dig site to dig site, but they will have to travel back to the park first. Every excavation cycle, your assigned teams will send their finders back to the park in the form of DNA. The yield amount of DNA is random, but can be improved by installing infrastructures at the dig site, such as housing, uh, the lab as well. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're good on that front. <laughs> Different species have their own yield varieties. So even if you decide to, to tackle Hell's Creek from day one, you're unlikely to unlock a Tyrannosaurus before a Montosaurus. Once 100% of the DNA has been found for a species, it can be bred from the animal nursery. Completing all animals within a dig site will unassign the relevant teams and return them to the park. Events. Okay, okay, okay. Now, what's this about? Everything we've discussed so far assumes that your excavation has gone smoothly, though. Every month, there are global events that randomly impact dig sites all across the globe. A positive event, like a fossil bloom, can help speed up the excavation process, drastically increasing yield amount as long as the event is active in a dig site. On the other hand, a negative event, like high export tax, can increase your operation cost, excavation time and lower yield, as your team struggle to send your excavated goods back to the park. Okay, I'm, I'm becoming such a massive geek right now, but this is incredible. I actually love this. Players may need to pivot their excavations from month to month, depending on how these conditions change. Taking advantage of sudden opportunities or temporarily leaving a site behind. What might have been a great month in Hell Creek formation may quickly turn into an expensive crawl next time. However, they did say that you can take your excavation team back to the park and it won't cost you in penalties. It will just obviously cost you in time. But yeah, that's awesome. Guest art overhaul. Moving into a more stylized art direction, the future brings a new era of visitors to prehistoric kingdom. Intended to introduce better faces, hairs, clothing, new ethnic... Okay, I can't say that word. Basically, we're going to have more diverse people. And an expressive suite of animations that make the park feel more alive. I'm actually going to miss our derpy guests and how terrifying they look, but this looks awesome. These look really good. So we have some progress animations here. So we've got a, a little selfie going on. It does, however, say that because of technical issues um, to make the selfie work, that it's not going to be an update living, which is totally fine. It's uh, still looking really awesome. 
Then we've got a guest here which is scratching their head, a little bit confused. Where am I? I don't know. Then someone who is extremely happy. Oh look, a dinosaur. That would be me, essentially. I feel I feel like this is me. <laughs> the, this is me going to my dinosaur park. Um, which looks really awesome. And then we've got guests actually being able to sit on a bench. There she goes. She's standing up. She's sitting down. Ah, oh, this looks so good. Simplicity, guys. But really, really does look absolutely incredible. And then back to our gorgeous T-Rex. So it was a long one today. And I did obviously had to chip in with my opinion of everything but let me know what you guys think what is your takeaway from the new dev diary what are you most excited about uh let me know in the comments below and i'll catch you guys in the next one so until then take care